Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird, uh, for reading those scriptures for us so powerfully, but also thank you for sharing a little bit of your testimony this morning. Um, I, too, uh, to quote M.A., I love this time of year when we prepare our hearts and minds to remember our loved ones. Uh, but I do want to give a couple shouts out. Um, one, it's good to see our family back again uh, from uh, out of town. They're visiting with us. But also... Um, my boss is here this morning, uh, and we are grateful for that. It is our district superintendent, Robin Bell. And Robin, can you just wave your hand over there? And Robin, uh, I am grateful. We are grateful for your leadership. Thank you. She uh, has just started this past July. Uh, our former DS, David, took an appointment up in New York City. And so I am grateful. We are grateful that you are our guest today. And uh, I promise I'm not nervous. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, Trinity, will you repeat after me? God has a word. And it is for me, and it is for you. And today is a special Sunday in the life of our church. And I say church, capital C, global church. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of service, today we celebrate World Communion Sunday. And there's many things that you can take out of World Communion, but two things that we celebrate that stick out into my mind uh, is we remember the church around the world that is joined together as one. Joining together as one, as we celebrate and remember that together uh, what Jesus said, that, that we would be unified. But we also remember this holy sacrament that we're about to partake on. Yes, we take it at the beginning, first Sunday of every month, but again, we remember, we reflect, and we celebrate all those around the world that are celebrating this holy meal, which is why I particularly love our passages for us this morning, this letter that was written to the church, to a city in Philippi, uh, I would say was a bit of a challenge to them. As you hear these words, the first hearers of these words were, were somewhat challenged because it was an urge for them to stand firm and to call to sharpen their focus on what ultimately really matters, the call to be united and the call to be one. And he challenged them to follow the example of Jesus in this message and uh, called them to focus their mind and heart what ultimately God was, was wanting to do in that first century. You see, you have to understand, Paul shared this message with a bunch of interesting folks. Because in this community, they were filled with diversity. They had some challenges. Uh, they were unjust to each other at times. They had controversies, they had different opinions, and sometimes someone's ego got out of control and they got a little selfish and conceited. Um, do we know anyone like that, right? Do we know any churches like that? Do we know any families like that? And so again, Paul is writing this letter and he says, hey, all of you, listen up. If you have, and notice the word here that he uses, if, because it wasn't like it was a possibly it could happen, possibly not. But he says, if you, since you have encouragement in Jesus Christ, since you know from the depths of your, of your soul the consolation that God continues to give you, since you know and share of the sweet spirit that, that ultimately empowers you, since you know how it feels to have compassion and grace and mercy from God, then you need to stop all of this division. Stop all this fighting. Stop acting like you have lost your minds in a way. Stop being petty and get it together. Because, and I say because, as he says, it's time for us to unite. Because uniting is not just something that we say we do. Because if we truly figured out how to stop doing all that stuff and ultimately remain united... You would, as Paul would say, we would understand that our joy and strength comes when we are together. That our peace, the practice of shalom and hope comes when we are united. That our heart and mind, when they are well, they are, we are united. So getting united is not just for the select few, but ultimately getting united is ultimately for everyone. And when you do that, your joy will be complete. Now notice, did you hear how Paul tells them to unite? He tells them to unite in four different ways. Be of the same mind, 
have the same love, be in one of accord, and then also one in mind. Think about that for a moment. Be of the same mind. Be of the same mind, how you think, how you feel, how you love. Having that same love, not that agape love that is just one-sided, but it is that philos love. It is that I love you, you love me, the Jesus in me, the Jesus in you. Also on one accord. In Greek, it means with breath. And in essence, it means sharing one another's life, one another's soul. And lastly, of one mind, focusing our thoughts, our actions, and how we live, making sure that we do not do any harm. 2,000 years later, this message about uniting ourselves together is still the same today. Because we know that we have a lot of divisions going on. There's some craziness going on. There are some injustices going on. There are families and relationships being torn apart. And on this special day, this World Communion Sunday, again, we are reminded once to practice this love and to be united. Now, I'm hammering this word at us this morning, being united. And it does sound easy, doesn't it? Our hearts and our minds, we we get it, but somehow, at times, it doesn't happen. And that's why this and this is so crucial. It's so important that I even saw on a sign the other day from the National Heart Association that both these two, mind and heart, are ultimately connected. They work in tandem together. And when they are working right, all the good stuff ultimately comes out. And when they're not working right, you know that something is wrong, something is disconnected. Being mindful with the heart and mind and our experiences, right, perceives ultimately the information that comes from it. Again, if something comes good to the heart and mind, we get excited. But if something is tragic, something is bad, something is harmful, there again is a disconnect. So Paul is talking about this heart and mind connection and ultimately pushing us to go a little further. Further. Do nothing, as he says, from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interest, but to the interest of others. In essence, what Paul was saying is that I need you to see right here for a moment. If you can see one another, then you can love them. And if you love them, then you can be united with them. I see you, Paul says, because once you see someone, right, once you ultimately see someone, it's really hard to destroy someone at the same time. Not if you're facing them face to face and seeing them for who they are. Seeing is a natural and spiritual thing. As I shared with you last week, if I take my glasses off, I'm going to see you beautiful people, but all of you are going to be fuzzy. But if I put my glasses back on, I not only see you, but I see the gifts that you bring. I not only see the physical traits that that God has made you with, but I see your heart and your mind and what God created you to be. And so again, even in the midst that we might disagree, I still step back for a moment and I'm going to watch what I say and what I do and how I treat you. I'm going to think about the need that you have in that moment because every now and then we ultimately need to take a step back. And when you have to take a step back, you got to take a step back for the right reasons. The reason why Paul is telling them to look, if you get this right, the grace that you so lean into, the grace will ultimately blow your mind as you continue to push forward, not alone, but together. And he keeps on going on. In case you forget this, you need to look at the best example, the perfect example. And he sings this beautiful hymn of the church, who though he was not the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Jesus, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient, yes, to the point of death, even death on a cross. This word humble, 
I think at times when we define the word humility or being humble, we often think that we need to go out and not say anything, ultimately allow people to treat us like a walking doormat. No, that is not humility. But again, humility is seeing that person, seeing the gifts that they bring. Now, what it also means, too, is it doesn't mean that we bite our tongue because sometimes, sometimes when you are called to unite and humble yourself, you got to stand up for something. Amen? And we're called to stand up for something. Love, righteousness, justice, goodness, mercy. And again, we know all this, don't we? We're not hearing anything new this morning because we know this to be true in our hearts and minds, but sometimes, again, it is somewhat challenging. And why is that? Well, I would think Paul is trying to suggest something here that ultimately, who are you connected with? Are you connected not only with the divine source? In this case, Jesus was connected with God, but he's asking this community, are you connected to that source? That source that empowers you, that, that, that compels you to go out and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Church, again, we are reminded that being united is an intentional act. And the love of God that, has, that God has for us, we strive to be united with one another. Again, with heart and mind, despite our differences, despite how we might think towards one another, or how, but we come together knowing that greater we can be together than we are alone. And what better way to be reminded of that than this beautiful gift right behind me? the gift that we globally today remember and celebrate together. A gift where here in our denomination, the United Methodist Church, that it is not Trinity's table or the Methodist Church's table, but it is our Lord's table, and everyone, all, are welcome to come and partake and be a part of it. This is, again, where we are reminded that all of us are together as one, as Jesus prayed in that final prayer. And so, as a community, as beloved community, we're going to do something a little different this morning. As we remember, we're going to go back to the traditional sayings, and I want to invite you to turn to your red hymnals on page 13, as we all profess the great thanksgiving together. Again, that's in your red hymnals, hymnals on page 13. The Lord be with you all. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you. Creator God, Father Almighty of heaven and earth, and so with your people on earth and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us with a new covenant by water and spirit. And we remember that night a night in which you gave yourself up for us and you took bread and gave thanks to you, O oh God. Broke the bread and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat from it, remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and said, gave it to his friends and said, drink this, all of you. This is the cup of salvation poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from it, remember me. And so, holy God, we remember you in your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here this morning and on these gifts of the bread and the cup. 
Make them be for us the body and the salvation of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your grace. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours now and forevermore. Amen. And so we remember this holy meal.